All right, go. Okay. <laughs> Hello, everybody. We are on our episode 10? Episode 10. 10. Episode 10. It's our last podcast episode for the year, and we're going um, to be covering our top 10 list for Trent and me today. So let's just hit it off. So Trent, you can start us off. Uh, first, can you explain like what was your, I guess, criteria for picking your list? So the criteria I have is games that I like playing. It's not strictly what I think are the top 10 games of 2019 that everyone would agree upon. It's the ones that I like the most that got to the table that my group enjoyed. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what I went with. And so it's okay. mostly what I felt like were the top 10, but it was weighted on like, can I get it to the table? Yeah. And did people like it? Okay. Okay. What was your criteria? Yeah, so um, when I looked at my, all the games that I had played this year, I had about 20 games. So with that, I have basically had to choose half of them for my top 10. So it didn't seem right to try and do something like, you know, the best top, you know, best 10 games out of those, those 20. Mm -hmm. It seemed a little boring to me. So what I focused on was um, which of these games I'm more excited to play. So, or excited to see that, to know that we were going to be playing for the night. So that's how I decided on my games. Yeah, and these are not all games that came out in 2019. These are yep. just games that we played in 2019. I have Catan in there too, so. Yeah. yeah. So I played about 45 games, unique games this year. You played 20, so that's kind of where our lists come from. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what's your number 10? Number 10, I put Feast for Odin. I only got to play this with my wife, not our group. Although I think our group would potentially, like depending on who comes on the night, would enjoy it. The reason why I like Feast for Odin is it just feels like the theme and the like the worker placement part of the game actually just fades away and it just feels like you're exploring as Vikings, you're pillaging, you're fishing, you're hunting, you're doing all these things and it's really fun to try and just go for any strategy because it's a worker placement but there's like 46 options you can choose from Okay. Yeah. on your turns and so that makes it really open for whatever you want to do and you're building off of your previous turns, it's kind of fun, so I like mm -hmm. it. And you're like collecting weapons and things to... It's a big board. It's a big board. There's many additional boards. There's the lands you can discover and add to your board in, okay. this, in the game too. So that's what makes it fun. It's just too heavy to play with our group. I think it would be like a three to four hour game for the first time we play it. So what exactly makes it heavy compar in comparison to the other worker placements that we've been playing? Just the explanation, there's 46 places you can okay. put your guy, and they all interact with your board in different ways. So you okay. have to explain the board and how to populate it, how you get points, mm -hmm. and all the things that it does. And there's like, there's two boxes full of unique little cardboard cutouts that you, you can collect and then flip and upgrade. So this is just too much. Okay. So teaching would take 45 minutes, and then game 30, uh, three hours to four hours for a first game. So that'd be a great one for Saturday. And then subsequent plays would be a lot shorter, mm -hmm. like a two-hour game night. So we, could, we can't do it as the first time we play it on Tuesday, though. Mm. That's why I can't bring it. Okay. <laughs> How has Joanne been feeling about that game? How she likes it. Okay. Yeah, we've played it three or four times. So mm. she liked okay. it a lot. Yeah. Compared to, like, Pipeline or something, which similar weight, according to Board Game Geek, she likes Feast for Odin a lot more, I think. Mm, okay. Well, my top, uh, my number ten was Tiny Towns. Number ten? Mm -hmm. Why is it ten? Well, as I said earlier, you know, I tried to choose these games in the order of what am I exci excited to play. Yeah. Yeah. And Tiny Towns, I'm not too excited, you know, about it. I mean, I like the game, and it hits on a lot, of, a lot of points that I like in a game. Mm -hmm. uh, I like Tetris. Mm -hmm. I like puzzles. I like, um, I, I, I also like the spatial elements of it. Yeah. But, I mean, in, in comparison to all the other games that I played, I don't think I like it as much. Mostly because, um, I, I've been sharing about this a lot on our forum, uh, about, related to my wife, Anna, mm -hmm. how she prefers games that have a lot of player interaction. Yeah. And, 
the more I think about it, I think I'm very similar to her too.、Mm. I like player interaction. So with Tiny Towns, where it's mostly has to do with、um, just、uh, playing on your own board. I mean, there is the aspect of trying to mess up the other players by choosing certain colors that it's that's not going to beneficial to、yeah. them. But yeah, in most of the first plays, you're mostly just you know looking out for your own colors that you want to build on. I see. So. Yeah, that was my experience. Yeah,、so. and I can see you saying like it's not something you're excited to play. I guess I'm almost in the same category where I'm not excited, but it's such a fantastic game that like I、mm-hmm. choose it so often, and it's so good <laughs> to teach quickly and play with a group up to six that takes less than an hour, even for six people. Like the thought of that is exciting to me.、Mm-hmm. Not like any specific thing or like turns I look forward to or strategies I'm trying to build, like I do with like Quacks or something. But yeah. I can see what you're saying. <laughs> that all makes sense. I mean, I do find that Tiny Towns is more exciting than Azul, though,、mm-hmm. because as much as I like Azul and just the components, you know, just the nice tiles to play with. Yeah.、Um, and yeah, but yeah, Azul is in the same category where there isn't too much、uh, player interaction unless you're playing with people who are a lot more cutthroat. And really trying to mess up one another. Yeah, typically hate drafting, what's yeah, which that is known as is a bad tactic because you usually lose, and then the other person may or may not、mm-hmm. lose because there's two other players usually that are just going for their own sake and winning. Yeah, I feel the same about Azul, but it might be because I played it probably like twenty or thirty times <laughs> since two thousand eighteen, just for like video's sake and trying to learn some strategy. Yeah. So I think part of it's a little bit of burnout.、Mm, yeah. So. Yeah. Tiny towns.、Um, okay. So what about your number nine? I don't remember. What did I write? I wrote just one. Just one is, I think, best party game of since Code Names. So I like Code Names. I like the Crypto. I like Just One. Those are my three go-to party games that I、mm-hmm. own and like. I have a few others I don't play, and I've played a few others I don't like. Just one, I think, should be on everybody's shelf.、Mm-hmm. If you like code names and you don't want to play it, just one is perfect because it's easier to teach and it's just as compelling to play, and it can go up to seven players. The only times you'd want to play code names if you have exactly eight players instead of seven or lower. Yeah. So I think it's just such a simple premise that feels like there's enough strategy that I'm getting excited about it because, for some reason, like the classic party games like categories and those like taboo and I just really don't get excited for. Just one feels like the modern day gamers party game.、Mm-hmm. Not, it won some sort of like best party game in 2019, anyways. So、yeah. I think it's justifiable, but I put it pretty low because you know it's. Kind of like Tiny Towns for you. I'm not excited to play it, but、yeah. that might also be because I've played it a whole bunch. I brought it to every holiday event with family and <laughs> kind of got burnt out on it. So I'm looking for the next big party game to satisfy my hunger for party games that have strategy. Yeah, but I can see what you mean by you know in your comparison to code names, it's so hard to play code names because of the just the number of people you need to get it out.、Mm-hmm. And so, just one. I mean, I'll be mentioning that later in my list, but it's definitely a family game that I've been approaching a lot, just because it's so easy to get out, and I know for sure that people are gonna enjoy it when I get it out. Yeah. So, yeah. What's your number nine? My number nine is Catan. Ah, yes. Catan. Nineteen ninety-five classic. Catan. <laughs> so, just as a reminder,、um, for. Those who don't know much about me, and I'm sure lots of people don't know much about me. So I got <laughs> into the hobby、um, basically this year. So since then, I've been going through all these. Basically, all the games that I played are new to me games,、mm-hmm. basically. So, Catan was one that I've been wanting to play because I always saw it as somewhat of a big milestone that I need to have as a hobbyist.、Mm-hmm. I just want you know, even though there are so many good games out there, I just wanted to be able to check off that list that I play Catan,、mm-hmm. and to be able to share that with others. And I got to do that during Thanksgiving with my in-laws and my wife, and it was fun. I mean, I enjoyed it a lot.、Uh, like I mentioned earlier, I like 
I, I've been finding more and more that I like interactions with other people uh, during a game. <laughs> and Catan fits that really well because you know, there's that constant moment of nego ne negotiations mm -hmm. with the resources, um, the parts of you know, constantly trying to mess up the other players through the night. Or, yeah, just those kind of things. Are you going to buy your own copy? No. Why? Well, I would have. I would have. Because, mostly because Anna loved it so much. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I would, but I can't play with two players. Yeah. Yeah. It's three to four players. Yeah. Such an odd... Yeah. It's like a rare player count for games these days. Yeah. I mean, Anna wants to play again. Yeah. And I was going to, you know, eventually... I, w I was going to buy Welcome To mm -hmm. this week. And I was going to add one more just to, you know, take off the shipping cost on Amazon. Yeah. And I was trying to find a game that would be a good fit for her. And she really likes Catan, but yeah, you can't just because of that. You just got to play with Emmett. Yeah. <laughs> That'll be a long, long wait. <laughs> yeah. So that's my number nine. Okay. Gotcha. So Plus, Wayland has Catan, so you just borrow it. Yeah. I mean, a bunch of people have Catan, so. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so for my number eight, man, that's pretty low. I put Wingspan at number eight. Oh, me too. Hey, look at that. We're both Wingspan yeah, at number eight. Let's together then, yeah. I love yeah. Wingspan. It's just like so low because I love so many other games more and mm -hmm. I would rather play them. And, you know, we played Wingspan last night at our game night. It's a fun engine building game with really outstanding components like the birdhouse, the, or the bird feeder, the, the wooden dice, the eggs, the, the mm. board itself, everything is wonderful, and even the art. But there's nothing like, I don't, I think it's your tiny town thing. I'm not drawn to it, I'm not excited about it. There's no moments that I'm looking forward to having in the game. Yeah. And the last two or three plays, the engines I've been trying to build just kind of fall flat, and it makes me sad. Because the most fun I have is like, winning's fun, but it's more fun to make something cool, I think. Uh, at least I have more fun making cool things. Yeah. And I keep trying and they just don't work out and then I feel like the game's over and I didn't get to have my little fun that I was trying to have. Yeah. So I I like how it fits a nice niche of like, you could teach it in like 20 minutes and then play, how, depending on how many p players you have, is like 60 minutes to two hours. So it's like a reasonable amount of time. We could play it on a Tuesday easily with no matter what kind of gamer comes. So I like that, and I like the purple eggs that I got from the European expansion. That was definitely worth buying. The purple eggs. Yeah, the Just purple eggs. <laughs> the other cards at the round end, the other stuff, like I think the purple eggs are my favorite part. Yeah, I mean, even though we had the expansion last night, mm -hmm. I didn't get to use any of them, any of the birds, just because it never, actually my wife was playing and I was just watching, but yeah. I mean, she had some expansion cards. Oh, maybe I missed out then. Because yeah. the the expansion isn't just new types of birds. They have other brown birds. They have other white birds, other okay. pink birds. Okay. There's just the new blue ones are definitely expansions. Mm -hmm. But, like, it's really subdued if it's an expansion or not because you only have to check the little country it's from. But everyone had European birds in there. Yeah. And, I mean, I feel, the simil I feel similarly about Wingspan. Um, I like what it has the beautiful illustrations. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, I really love the little uh, bird facts that, that, that they have on the cards and just the amount of attention to the detail, which is like from the texture of the rule book yeah. and to the components with the eggs. You know, it's just really fun to play with. But besides all those things, if I were to strip away all those visual things, um, textile things, then ultimately it turns into that solitaire, uh, a lot of just trying to shift to the cards to get the ones that you want to mm -hmm. try and build your engine, which takes a while too. I feel like the rounds end so much earlier than I, like like you mentioned, Yeah. to have the chance to build something really cool. Yeah, yeah. that's a good point. It does feel like the game, the last two or three games ended a little, like a, I wanted like two more turns yeah. at least because it's just like things are starting to roll and I'm starting to make it happen. And then I'm like, oh, this is the right bird. And then it's over before that happens. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
the way my wife put it, Anna, yesterday, because it was her first time playing. Mm -hmm. And it's really fun to hear her comments because she's completely new to board games, completely new to, she's, she's not aware of any sort of hype. So there's not, no <laughs> bias that she's going in with. Right. It's just her pure experience. And so one of the comments that she made was that it felt like people were playing poker, is what she said. Mostly because she saw that everyone was just like focused on their own hands and uh, just making their plays. Uh, that I feel like she doesn't know poker then. <laughs> well, I think she meant it in terms of like how everyone was just like serious, just like focused on their own thing, and very just like isolated. I guess so. I mean, that's yeah. just any engine building game, in my opinion. It's hard to have conversations unless the game forces you to, like in Catan, when you're mm -hmm. actually forced to trade. But those are just game interactions. Yeah. 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 Most of the games I pick have a lot of multiplayer solitaire mm -hmm. to it, and you're just focused on building what you're trying to do. Maybe I need to introduce some more conflict and bring <laughs> Root out when it's like you, me, and Joanne, because... I'm with, afraid how <laughs> that's going to go with our group. I think <laughs> if uh, we have the right people, we can get it and get it done quickly. I don't know. We'll see. I'm fearful for you and Joanne. Yeah, we're going to play Scythe soon, so I think that'll be a good warm-up. There's not as much conflict in that as Root. Hmm. We'll see. Okay, well, I mean, we both went through our number eight. That's so true. Seven for you. My number seven is Parks. This one did come out this year by Keymaster Games, I believe. And this game is absolutely beautiful. The art is a partnership between Keymaster and like the, uh, there's like this project called like the 59 Illustrations of National Parks or something where they got 40 artists to do this amazing art collection. And the gameplay itself, it's a little, it feels like a mini worker placement. Mm. If I wanna play the ultimate worker placement game, I'm gonna play Viticulture with Tuscany. If I want, uh, that's gonna last like two, three hours, depending on the group. Yeah. The thing about Parks is it's lovely art, all the components are wonderful, the gameplay is pretty unique and interesting, maybe not mind-blowing, but it lasts 30 to 60 minutes, depending on how many players, and that's really nice. And it's just like so delightful, so easy to teach too, because you just put your little hiker on a thing, you collect resources, and you use those resources to buy point cards. Mm. And so with that simplicity, people can learn it and get the idea of it, and you just start going, hiking through the forests. I like it a lot. And I think it's something that, it's also easy to pack because it's so small, so I can bring it if I want. <laughs> yeah, I keep bringing it to family gatherings to see, like my brother would be someone I could play with or my couple of my cousins, but then we always have everybody that's gonna play, so we always play like just one or, mm -hmm. Even Welcome To was too too much for most of the group, and they fell off, so getting parks out would be difficult. Too much, as in? Like? Too complex? Too complex. So, like, yeah. 10 minutes of teaching, that okay. is an eternity for some <laughs> of my family. So, I, uh, my, I think I'll bring parks to Christmas, too, because it's uh, such a wonderful game, but uh, we'll see. What's your, uh, what are we on? Number seven. Well, I, I did have a question on parks, though. Um, okay, sure. So do you see that becoming stale at all after multiple plays? Yeah, I think it's got the Azul appeal where it's fun, it's interesting, it's beautiful. But over time, like, I will get burnt out and not want to play it anymore. Uh, but it fits a niche. So the, the quick gameplay, that's something that, I can pull it out if I want to work a placement that's less than an hour. Hmm. And that's, unless something else fits that, it's going to stick around. Mm -hmm. And that's why Azul never comes out anymore, because when I would bring that out is the same time I bring out Quacks or Tiny Towns. I want something that takes an hour at most yeah. and is fun, entertaining, easy to teach. The Tiny Towns and Quacks is always going to do that mm -hmm. instead of Azul. I don't have anything to compare with Parks that kind of fits the same criteria. Right, right. Like, I would, it would be a completely different type of game. Like, I'd want to play Dominion or something where it's still easy to teach and there's some good strategy. But, you know, it's a totally different play group as well. So, mm -hmm. I don't know. Okay. Yeah, I, I was just curious because um, I thought about possibly getting it um, to play with Anna. So. Oh, yeah. That could be a good one, actually. Yeah. 
I'm, I'm not sure. I'm still figuring things out, and I'm just asking our, our I think users it's, on the forum constantly about it, too. So, yeah, I think yeah. that one's pretty inexpensive. It's like $35 or something, mm -hmm. comparatively to other board games. Okay. It's so it like makes my heart like when we were, when we played Wingspan I put the bird song bird sounds on in the background and when it's parks I put nature sounds it's more general nature and it's just like it's like a wonderful experience like it's it's a great night when I play that instead of just browse YouTube by myself or something yeah. for a few hours I'd much rather play parks than do that I'll probably just borrow it from you someday and then try it out yeah, yeah. totally worth it have you played it yet no oh, oh we yeah. should we should play it. That's great. There are so many games we need to play. Maybe we should test out a Let's Play during our podcast time. And, like, I'll just fill in time with the interviews or something, or I don't yeah. know. I mean, that would be cool. Yeah. If we had a chance to play some of those games that we have on our shelf, mm -hmm. um, that we co-own or something, right. I would definitely have some of the games like Pipeline and others in my list currently. Yeah, that would be a whole night. Tapestry. Nice. Well, so for my number seven, I put down Ultimate Fighters. And I don't know if I could do that, if that's legal or not, because it doesn't <laughs> exist yet, you know. Uh, it hasn't been published yet. Um, it it's a game that Trent designed and has been developing for quite a long time, but it's just been on the back just because we've been focusing on Board Game Atlas. And it's also a game that I partnered with Trent on for our for the illustrations of the cards. Mm -hmm. And the main reason I you know I put it on here you know not for promoting the game at all, but mostly because I like you know just the fighting. It's a pure fighting game uh, where you have multiple champions or monsters creatures mm -hmm. uh, that you're fighting you know other players with. And it's, it's reminiscent of games like Smash mm -hmm. or others, where it's just pure brawling. Uh, you have a deck of cards for, where you can um, use to attack, defend, uh, poke one another mm -hmm. to deal a certain amount of damage. And each creature uh, has variable powers uh, they can use. And yeah, I mean, it hits a lot of things that I like about um, I mean, it, it's short also, uh, just like how you were mentioning about parks and other games yeah. that fill that niche of you know that short gameplay. Mm -hmm. And Ultimate Fighters is one where we can get finish a round in like 30 minutes, I say, or less, maybe. Definitely less. Yeah. If you, it's a it's an interesting game because it's two to five players. Yeah. So it like a lot of games that people think of when they think of fighting games are trying to be like Street Fighter, but this is different. It's two to five players, and it's more like Super Smash Brothers than it is like Street Fighter, where you have a character that you pick, but you also have a stage that affects the gameplay, where your movements and mm -hmm. your tactics are different. Uh, it, there's technically no movements in Ultimate Fighters, but it feels like you're moving in different ways. And so, like, I think the... I like it because gameplay, like with Bobber, we played three rounds in about 40 minutes. Yeah. And that's because the gameplay can be pretty quick, especially if you know the rules, uh, and you just play multiple rounds. But then there's always new characters and new stages because there's seven stages and there's nine characters, and so yeah. any combination can make any game mm -hmm. interesting, and you can like scale it up to more people. So it's like a fun game to play because it almost like when I play it, I just like imagine the anime scene of it. <laughs> happening out because it's so fun like every attack is pretty unique and mm -hmm. flexible and fun and it feels like you're actually within like the the desert throwing people into cactuses or in the ice throwing snowballs or setting up snowmen decoys and stuff it's yeah. super fun yeah i mean we played you know when we attended the cal poly con we played about nine games in a span of like three hours so mm -hmm. that's pretty quick gameplay and Another thing that I like about uh, the game is that there's certain, I mean, the illustrations help um, because Herrick, you know, did such an awesome job with them. Yeah. And I also like that, you know, with each creature having their own set of um, powers, uh, I can see the personalities of each of those creatures coming through. Yeah. And I can s definitely see that some are the ones that are, you know, the annoying type. Like Teemo in League of Legends, if you're, if you've, 
ever played that game. I'm sure he's annoying. Yeah. I haven't played. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, I'm looking for, I, I like um, Ultimate Fighters, and I'm looking forward to when we can finally share it with others, too. Yeah, I think that's one of the videos I'll be making next is doing a review of it like I would for anything else, hmm. showing it off. Because it's such a fun game, and I have a pretty nice prototype at this point. Yeah. I just need to wrap the current box with the art, and I think it'll be good to go. Mm -hmm. Well, enough about Ultimate Fighters. Uh, you're number six. Number six, I put Root. That this... low? <laughs> <laughs> that low, yeah. Root, I put that low because it's something that I enjoy every single time I play. It's a solid game. It's a lovely art, really fun interaction with players, really fun dynamic of the strategy of each one being unique, each character you play. But I just can't play it that often. Yeah. Like, my wife and I, we don't tend to play games with lots of conflict involved because that creates a lot of conflict. <laughs> And we know that, so we uh, play games that promote less conflict. Yeah. And, like, as much as even, like, if she weren't to play on the game night, because sometimes she sits out, it's still, like, we're going to be up, because we start at, like, 7.30. We've mm -hmm. tried playing it two or three times, and we are up to 11, 11.30 even sometimes. It's such a long time to play. Partly because we have new players, but partly because there's a lot of decisions to choose between, and it takes a while. Yeah. So that's why it's a little lower. If I were just to rank it on gameplay, it would be higher, but because of our current setup, that's why it's number six. I see. Yeah. Uh, user Esterain, um Scott, Root is his, one of his favorite games. Yeah. And I think I saw that he played about 10 times this year. Mm hmm because you know we were going through the you know the each user's you know profiles you know how you prepare that new page for us yeah being able to clearly see all the games that you played in the year yeah. with all the you know good visuals mm -hmm. and I saw that and I felt jealous yeah because <laughs> I think I only got to play like three times this year I think we need to set up yeah. a maybe not every week but like monthly Saturday game days where we could play the longer three plus hour games. Mm -hmm. So that we can get through, because that's going to be Pipeline, that'll be Feast Road, and that'll be Gloomhaven if you want to play that, or even games like Root. I think that'd be worth having, because I want to be able to play those with more than just Joanne, because I think she would enjoy it if it's a four-player game of Root. She would not if it's just one-on-one. -on -one. Right, right. And to be fair, I mean, we've had other games on our Tuesday nights that took just as long, uh, or fairly close as Root like Viticulture. Uh, we've had one or two games where it went close to Pretty three late. hours. Yeah. Yeah. So. It's a good point. But, I mean. Just do it anyways. <laughs> <laughs> Just play it knowing that it'll be late. Well, my number six was Skull Hollow. So it's another fighting game. And it's not like I especially like fighting games. Mm -hmm. But, again, I, um, like, there are... There are a couple of things about me as a gamer where I really, really enjoy tactics, tactical or strategical games, and player interactions, like I mentioned earlier. And Skull Hollow was kind of my s surprise game of the year. Yeah. Just because I, I didn't, I had no idea what to expect from it. Just because the box art doesn't really indicate much of what the game will be about, especially the, if you just look at the front of the box cover, which yeah. is just pure black and a little bit of like a very minimal uh, design of, you know, indicating the monster or something. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but it's a game where it's just, you know, one to one, one, uh, 1v1, one and you are playing as either the fox, the fox and heroes, or the monster or the guardians, as they call them. Mm -hmm. And so it tries to replicate a lot of that, you know, that classic boss battle scene. Like in Legend of Zelda, let's say, mm -hmm. where, you're, where Link is going up against this boss that has, you know, that is massive and has, has multiple, like, limbs. Yeah. And then you have to target certain points within those limbs mm -hmm. to be able to damage that monster. Yep. And Skullcaller is very similar in that way, um, where you're trying to 
use your actions to the in the most efficient way possible to be able to climb onto the monster and hit, hit its weak points and try to deal damage to it. And also, and I also like that Skull Hollow comes with, you know, uh, lots of different um, guardians. I can't remember how many there were. There's four. Four. Okay. Not that many, but yeah. Yeah. I think if I were to rank those two games together, Ultimate Fighter or Skull Callow, mm-hmm. I'd personally put Ultimate Fighters above Skull Callow. Okay. And the reason why is in Skull Callow, it's got this lovely gameplay. I like the, the cards and how they've got the Gloomhaven style of the top and bottom to choose from. So you always feel like you can do something. Mm-hmm. But there was a point at which, like, maybe five turns away from the end, mm-hmm. or maybe more, it was. It felt inevitable because I had gotten to a point where it's like there's no returning for you, and maybe that's just because. And I think I've seen this in the reviews of it that the the introductory face off between the the bear and the the hero I chose mm-hmm. is pretty one sided. Mm-hmm. Like I just felt like the game was over, but we're just kind of working through it until it actually ended. Yeah. And in Ultimate Fighter, there's never that point, at least not that far in advance. Like. You can maybe see who's going to win like one to two turns away, but that's like one or two minutes away from the game ending, which is, yeah. I think, a, a nice benefit. And it's always a mystery because it's more close to Magic the Gathering where they could have one last card that's an out to to, to have a victory. Mm-hmm. So that's why I would put it above Skull Callow, but Skull Callow, with you. still beautiful, still wonderful. Yeah, I, I can definitely see what you mean because, you know, I played as Grack the Guardian. Yeah. You played as a Fox and Heroes. Yeah. And I just felt so small by yeah. the end. I mean, in the very beginning, I felt so big just because mm-hmm. I'm just like laser beaming you and then just like killing you again yeah. and again and again. Stopping, swiping, attacking. But as the uh, game progressed, I just felt like, okay, you're just slowly choking me. Yeah. And I have no, nothing that I can do really yeah, yeah. about it. Whereas Ultimate Fighters, like you said, it has that option of like, you know, like the Phoenix Down of uh, Final Fantasy where... Mm-hmm. You think you're dead, but you get to come back alive uh, with an almost like an evolutioned form mm-hmm. with all these new sets of ab- abilities yeah. that you can attack with. So, yeah, I can see what you mean about that. Yeah. Number five? Number five, I put Gloomhaven. I mm. have played 15 to 20 hours, I can't remember, of the wow. campaign. It's such a great game. The gameplay itself is cooperative, but it's mm-hmm. in this legacy style, campaign style, where you can... It's not like Pandemic Legacy where you do month to month and the story is kind of set for you. It's open and sprawling. You can do side quests. You can do the main quests. and You can kind of explore and do other things. So Joanne and I are the only ones. We've, we've played it as a couple. Mm-hmm. And that's the only experience I've had. But it's been amazing. Opening items, leveling up characters, getting new stuff. And we've just been tapping the surface of it. We're level fours. We've only had our first two characters. The prosperity of Gloomhaven is going up, but, you know, it's just, it's so exciting. There's so much more content to go through, so that's why it's number five. And it's not number one because it's not getting to the table with anyone else. And it's so much time to set up that, you know, we, I kind of want my own table for Gloomhaven, that I can have it always (laughs) set up. Then we would just play it, like, probably every night if we could. But because we have a two-year-old, we it's important to put things away otherwise they get lost forever <laughs> so i think it just because and i know there's apps that you go on with it and so maybe i just need to try mm-hmm. that out and see if that helps with the setup time and the the all the maintenance of the game itself yeah. it's so much fun though two questions are you going to get frost haven and two do you think you'll want to finish the base or the original one first before you get onto frost haven I definitely want Frosthaven, and I'm pretty sure if there's any sort of Kickstarter exclusive, I will 100% back it. <laughs> so, Isaac, if you make exclusives, you got me, and I think you got, like, a million other people, too. Probably. <laughs> yeah. So that if there's no exclusives, then I'm just going to wait for it to be on sale. Yeah. Uh, so I, I do want to finish Gloomhaven. I think it just needs to be the thing where I can have it out, and maybe I don't know if that's going to happen. We'll have to see. Is there a max level? Yeah, everyone has level nine as the max. Okay, okay. And there's a system of, like, once the a character has 
fulfilled their destiny, then they retire, and that's when you open a new character box. I see. That's how you unlock new ones, and then you don't play with the the one you've been playing with it mm-hmm. anymore. Mm-hmm. But you don't start at level one with a new one. You can if you want. You can start with however, if you've progressed in the world far enough, the base level kind of increases, so you don't start at level zero mm-hmm. anymore. I see. It's a very well-defined system. The rule book, 51 pages of joy to read through because it's so well written. It, it was amazing. I had like 90% competency. It felt like after just reading it once, and that's so rare for rule books. Like as much as I want and I expect to enjoy Scythe, it's so hard to get through that rule book for some reason. I just keep keep trying and then I keep failing and it's partly because I know it's going to take a while to play so I don't bust everything out. I can't ever imagine myself saying that it's a pure joy to read through 50 pages of a rule book. Well, I'm a little unique. I'm the guy who <laughs> reads all the rule books and I like doing that. So, Yeah, I mean, that's cool. I mean, Gloomhaven is it's just amazing because Gloomhaven alone basically carried our channel to you know, grow maybe like at least like half of our subs really. In terms of the news content that you you were posting, yeah, you know it's amazing how much traction that they get. Yeah, yeah. Gloomhaven or Frosthaven was one half. Yeah. Or I guess Gloomhaven, Jaws of the Lion, and Frosthaven. Yeah. And then yeah. South Park was the other half yeah, with yeah. their uh, their stuff. <laughs> oh, and Monopoly. Monopoly would be the third. Yes. Says half, quarter, quarter, or something. And eventually your marathons. Uh, yeah. yeah. Marathons. You see, you sound so excited about it. Uh, my number five is Welcome To. Number five? Yeah, number five. You put just one above Welcome To. Interesting. Why? Uh, you want me to answer that question? Uh, yeah, I'll answer that question. I mean, yeah. say why Welcome To is number five. Welcome To, I mean, I'm on, honestly not 100% on like why I put it here. Mm. But it's just a feeling. Mm. I, I like it. It does. It's very simple, but I like it. I, I'm just like drawn to it. Uh, I think the theme has to do with it a lot too, because it's so approachable. Yeah. And very relatable because it has to do with you know just houses. Yeah. 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 And it's a roll and write, and it's one of my it's my favorite roll and write. Mm-hmm. And I like it because it feel it, it's so important to me to have a game that that's quick. Like you know, you were talking about with parks and yeah. others, and welcome to is like that for me because you know ever since becoming a dad, it's so hard to find that time, and welcome to is one where you know, no matter how tired I am, uh, welcome to. I mean, it's it can be relaxing mm-hmm. compared to all the other games where I would have to, you know, as much as I love strategy and tactical games, I it's not like I I'm always in the mood for that, or have the energy for that for that either. And yeah. welcome to, yeah, just gives me that relaxing game time, downtime, where I can just enjoy it with my wife. Just, and I think you know it's the charm of the rolling, right? Where you know taking a something like something so rudimentary like a pencil and then just writing down you know all your you know results and keeping track of everything. I, I enjoy that. Yeah, yeah. I personally like using a fat sharpie when mm-hmm. playing mm-hmm. Welcome to, because it looks so visual mm-hmm. and especially for a marathon i mean you know i'm sure that was helpful to you too yeah probably so, yeah. bad for my health because this <laughs> room has no windows and i'm like sniffing sharpies for 24 hours <laughs> but whatever yeah but yeah i mean i'll get into that later but i put it below just one because again uh, welcome to as much as I enjoy it it doesn't have as much of the interaction with other players I see that makes sense okay so there's some thought that I put into these good (laughs) alright so you're number four my number four is tiny towns and like I was saying earlier whenever we have people over that haven't played quacks or tiny towns those are the Mm -hmm. two games that my wife and I always go to because we want to have a game that isn't just one and is a little bit more than Welcome To. Maybe Welcome To is in the same category, but we always, it's so easy to teach Quacks and Tiny Towns. Mm -hmm. I would prefer Quacks, which is why it's higher up. Mm -hmm. But Tiny Towns plays six players. Quacks only goes up to four. And so Tiny Towns is great because you can have 
two players and six players, and it's just about the same amount of gameplay time, which is great. Uh-huh. And that's why people like Seven Wonders. I don't like Seven Wonders because the <laughs> game time doesn't go up with Seven Wonders because everyone's playing at the same time. The same is true for Tiny Towns. The gameplay doesn't really increase because everyone's doing things at the same time. I like the puzzle. I like how replayable it is because you have every building can be four different buildings, essentially. You just mm-hmm. swap out the cards. So it's it's a lot of fun. And I like the little hammer piece. <laughs> Holding that is very satisfying. Yeah, I mean, I like it too. I mean, I like I said earlier, I enjoy Tetris a lot. So it's almost like playing a very slow-mo Tetris. And yeah. Uh, is there anything that you don't like about Tiny Times? Uh, not much. Not much. I like it a lot. I think I like Quacks better because it has a lot of potential, like potential energy for memorable moments. And Tiny Towns has less of that. Mm-hmm. It's more strict strategy and thoughtfulness. Right. So different types of games. And so Quacks, I, I just like get excited for. And Tiny Towns, I just kind of get ready for. <laughs> okay. Well, my number four is Quacks. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Are you okay with that? <laughs> I'm fine. You got some good ones above it. I would not put just one above it, but I think you have reasonable reasons why. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Quacks, I went into the game uh, with high expectations be- just because, I mean, it's received a lot of praise from people, mm-hmm. and you especially spoke very highly of it um, with your games with Joanne. Yes. And it's a game that, a game in which where you act as a witch. Is there another, as a quack, you know, uh, where you're one of those people who are trying to sell these fake medicines and trying to make money off of, off of people. And so you ha- each player has their own uh, board, basically in the shape of a pot. And you're throwing all these ingredients into the pot uh, to make more potions that you can sell. And by selling potions, you can then get money to buy more ingredients so that you can buy you, so that you can make more potions and then you're so you're constantly trying to uh, build up it's a bag building game where you're trying to secure all these different ingredients that build off of one another mm-hmm. where each of those ingredients have certain powers that'll help you to make a bigger batch of potions yeah. and I like quacks because one, it introduced bag building to me, and I like it a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's one of the reasons why I'm really excited for Wonderland's War, uh, a game that also involves bag building with mm. the theme of uh, Wonderland. Okay. Yeah, and I'm excited about that one. But the reason why I like bag building is because you're drawing these chips, these ingredients out of the bag. And you don't know which you know you will be drawing, and it's, so there's a lot of luck involved, and so it really satisfies that gambler side of me that's hidden somewhere deep within. Yeah, yeah. So it it tends to have a lot of big moments uh, of excitement or um, or just being disappointed by your draw. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of story moments. Yeah, I think it does have a good balance of strategy and probability-based decision-making with push your luck and trying to get farther than everyone else or be more consistent and never push compared to everyone else who does push to catch up. Yeah. It's a fun game because you have this explosion. It's called an explosion if you go too far, but it's not the end of the game for you. So you're still in it. You could still catch up. There's benefits to not exploding so i think it's a really fun game with Mm -hmm. every single turn potentially having an exciting moment yeah yeah i agree and i mean it kind of breaks the rule that you know i kept mentioning about player interaction and how much i value that and quacks has very very little of it but i think it still kind of fills a little bit of that for me because there's that indirect player player interaction where you get to see other people. Mm-hmm. That's like part of the fun. Seeing how others react to their draws, yeah. uh, their disappointment, yeah. and you know, how they're, oh, yes, you know. 
I so think that's part of the fun. Yeah, I think why it's so high up is Joy and I are both very animated with how we feel <laughs> in game moments, so it makes it fun because mm-hmm. there's a lot of t- opportunity for animation. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're number two. Let's do number three before number two. Number three. <laughs> it's getting late. <laughs> yeah. We can make the description shorter. So number three is Welcome To. I still feel like this game is great, even though I did the marathon 25 hours, 100 games straight. Yeah. I went that week and played six more times because I had friends that come over. I went to see family. It's such an amazing game. And so we talked about it earlier. Mm-hmm. I just think it's one of the best games ever at this point. I think it'll be a staple on my shelf forever to just pull off when I have a group of any size that wants something more than just a party game, but less than something that, like, Quacks or Tiny Towns or something. Mm-hmm. That 25-minute range. I think it's it's an amazing game. I'll keep playing it for a while. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What's your number three? Number three, just one. And why just one is, I mean, I'm sure you're wondering. Uh, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of word games out there, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and family games. Uh, so it's a very personal choice uh, because it's given me so many good memories with my family. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's so easy to get out, and I know exactly how well it'll do. I mean, it does well with just about any people. Yeah. And it's a word game where you're, it's a co op word game where, you know, the, the main goal of the game is to guess as many words as possible, you know, correct mm-hmm. uh, out of the 13 cards that you have available. For the round, yeah, and so you are in the same team, and each turn, one person takes uh, has to be the one to guess the the word, and for them to guess the word, the rest of your team is helping out by uh, writing down a one word clue, uh, and it has to be a unique clue, where if any of those clues happens to coincide, they all the same clues have to be thrown out. And so the person will have to guess a word, will sometimes uh, end up having to cho- having to guess a word based on just like one clue. Like for example, if it's grenade, and mm-hmm. the clue is like green, then it's impossible to choose. Yeah. And so it also leads to a lot of fun moments. Yeah, yeah. And it's so simple, and it's something that I can play with my parents really easily. So, yeah. Yeah, I think it's a great game for that, and it does lead to a lot of great memories. And like you can play with a lot more people than you can yeah. with a lot most of these games on the list. Yeah. Very Number nice. Number two. Number two. My top two. Top two, I think I have a two and a half that mm-hmm. I didn't feel like should go on this list because it's Texas Hold'em. <laughs> so I would put Texas Hold'em above Welcome To but below Viticulture in my excitement to play okay. and desire and who I can play it with. I love that game so much, and it's what I play with Joanne's family every time we visit. I look forward to it so much as well. It's so much fun. Uh, But my number two for board games, strictly, is Viticulture. Viticulture with Tuscany, Viticulture alone. It's always going to, it's such a fun game. Definitely one of my favorites of all time. Mm -hmm. And Tuscany adds just an extra 15%, I think, is the average for how much enjoyment it adds. And the data is sound. It's so great at being uh, a game that I, you know, the theme is like really approachable for most people because they've heard of wine. Yeah. Most people have heard of wine. And like when you explain like what you're doing is planting vines, harvesting them, making them into wine and fulfilling contracts. And then like you explain the actual mechanics of the game, it just feels like that's what you're doing. And then just surrounding that with solid engine building very cool variants that gets added in with the cards and just you know some interaction some limited interaction it just adds into this ultimate game that i always enjoy playing i look forward to playing Mm -hmm. so that's that's why it's my number two it's something that i can bring it's also up to six players it just hits so many great criteria for me that it makes it one of the best games i think it'll be in my next year's top 10, even if Quacks moves down, I think Viticulture will stay there because mm-hmm. it hits everything and it goes up to six players. Yeah. I mean, it's my number two, too. Nice. Yeah. And, I mean, I love the game. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I love the game. 
and it's the most thematic game that I played this year. Yeah. And I love it because so many of the mechanics, it just meshes so well with the theme. Like from, from the waking up of the workers and mm -hmm. how that decides how early you go, uh, mm -hmm. how early you move your workers in mm -hmm. comparison to everyone else. Mm -hmm. And even with Tuscany, how depending on how, how early you finish, you, that can also decide uh, you know, you know how early you retire for the day, and you get to choose your wake up time earlier than others. Mm -hmm. So, those kind of things, as well as just I don't know a whole host of so many different elements that attention to detail that they put into the game. Yeah, it's something that I just really love, and it really satisfied the strategy uh, strategist in me because especially with Tuscany. It just unlocks a whole world of different strategies. And yeah, I mean, I loved my first play of it last week, and I'm looking forward to playing more. Yeah. Great. All right, we made it. Number one, Quacks of Quedlinburg for me. And if I don't get the expansion to make it five players uh, this Christmas, I'm going to be buying it immediately after Christmas because I want it to be five players. That game is. Fabulous. It's so fun. Every round, something exciting can happen. You can either go really far into the culture and get lots of points and lots of money to buy more stuff, or mm -hmm. you can push your luck too far and explode, or my wife can do it and explode. And, you know, I'm not supposed to think it's funny, but yeah, sometimes <laughs> I do. It's such a great game, and it's so great to have something that I feel like could be intimidating, but it's pretty approachable once you start playing it. Yeah. It's like a ton of rules, it feels like, to some people. But then you start going, and you're like, this is a great game. And you start playing it, it's really easy to understand and kind of fun to build the bag, like you're saying. Mm. So, I like it. So why ahead of Viticulture? Just because of those moments. It's that, that last little bit of like what this list is particular is I look forward to playing it more than anything else, I think. Maybe, maybe that's not true. I think... Viticulture, I very much look forward to playing it too, but it just feels a little different. I think it's like I can only play Viticulture on Tuesday nights, mm -hmm. and I can play Quacks on Tuesday. I can play it when people are visiting. I can bring it and play with my family. I just, yeah. I can always play Quacks, I guess is the reason. And even though it doesn't go up to six players and that's like a big deal, yeah. I just look forward so much. And <laughs> I'm going to get the five, the fifth player expansion, so five players can play. It's also simultaneous. That's a big deal, because then that doesn't extend gameplay time that much either. That is true. That is true. Whereas Viticulture, yeah, it does get quite a bit longer. Yeah. <laughs> Our last session was, what, three hours or so? Yes. 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 It was. That's what we were considering. Should we play again? It would be shorter, but I kind of wanted to make sure it was shorter with Wingspan. So yeah. I think that was fun. Okay. Well, yeah. I mean, I can definitely see why you like Quack so much. So Yeah. yeah. So what's your number one, Phil? My number one is Root. It's a solid number one pick. Yeah. I mean, if you know me, I just talk about Root a lot on our forums. And part of it has to do with art. Um, the art is so charming to me. Uh, I mean, I'm an, I'm an artist myself. And Kyle's art, it just resonates me, with me so much. And I like that there's so much a, such a contrast between, you know, Cole's very in-depth, deep, weighty design versus Kyle's very charming and it's just, you know, very lighthearted. Mm -hmm. So it's, I mean, if Root had been illustrated in a similar fashion as like, let's say like TI4, like Twilight Imperium, mm -hmm. with those very serious, solemn characters looking out into the space, I feel like I would have been more, uh, more what's the word for it wouldn't have been as approachable yeah yeah uh, but the art drew me in but the strategy aspect is what really kept me in you know interested in the game yeah uh, because you know as i said i'm a strategy guy and root offers so much strategy because it's asymmetric all the factions play differently they have different rules and you have to constantly watch out for other players on what they're doing. There's never a dull moment because you know whenever a player makes a certain decision and makes an action, 
it affects everyone. And so you have to be on your toes and think about, oh, you know, I was planning this whole, you know, this thing that I was going to unleash on everyone, but because of one player and what they did, it's going to ruin everything. And then now I have to think about, you know, what else can I do? Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I have a lot of fun with it, but it's just a shame that I can't play it as much. Mm -hmm. And so my dream, my hope is that with Anna uh, seemingly really wanting games with interaction. I mean, that's got a lot of interaction. That will fill that void in our heart for games. Oh, man, that could be that could be <laughs> amazing. So that would be the triumphant return for, Root, for me mm -hmm. and get all the expansions and so on and so on. Maybe it'll happen one day. Yeah. <laughs> if not, the fallback plan is once you start working here full time, we'll just do like Let's Plays and then we have an yeah. excuse to play it during the day. Yeah. That sounds good. That's good work to me. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that was our top tens. So let's move on to user questions to uh, finish the night. Okay. So number one, it's from user... Um, let's see. Scurvy5. Scurvy5. So it has to be a Star Wars question. Okay. Have you guys pre-purchased the tickets for Rise of Skywalker? I have not because I have a two-year-old and that makes going out difficult. And a lot of my friends also have young children, so they're like also doing their own thing. So it's hard. I think I'll just wait for Disney+, Plus, yeah. which I do for most movies now. Wait for Disney+, Plus or Netflix, or Amazon, or Hulu to have it, and yeah. then I watch it there. By the way, I think the movie released today or some days ago. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Uh, the only potential is like my, I'm going up to see family for the holidays. Mm -hmm. And so maybe my, we can leave Elijah at home while we go watch. But yeah. I don't know that Joanne's that excited, so we probably won't. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I heard that people were making a big fuss over Rotten Tomatoes giving like 50% rating or oh, something. Oh, really? Yeah, something like that. Oh, man. But, but anyway. <laughs> uh, I mean, I'm excited for the for the movie. I never pre-purchased the tickets, but my older brother and my sister-in-law will be visiting um, for a week. Um, so the family will be all together in, in towns in slow. So that might open up an opportunity. So Yeah, yeah. I definitely want to see it, though. Yeah. Um, two, it is from... Oh, man, I missed on who asked this question. Okay, found it. It's from user Skyward. Uh, have you ever bought a game that you thought for sure that you and your loved ones would enjoy, only for it to fall completely flat, even with you? So I think not that specific criteria, but close mm -hmm. was PAX Premier 2nd Edition. Mm -hmm. I bought it knowing that most of the reviews for it all focused heavily on the components uh -huh. and less on the actual play itself. And like, I heard it was good still, but it wasn't like the clear standout amazing game. And so I bought it knowing that it was a limited print run and I wanted to make sure we had a copy. And then I went through the rules. It was just difficult to get through. Unlike Gloomhaven, which was a joy to go through. <laughs> This was kind of the opposite, where everything was too into the, the theme, and it's hard to like match up like, what does this character do, or this yeah. faction, or this thing, like the concept of it, how does it match up with the actual like mechanics of the game? And then it didn't just land very well with the three of us, it was you, me, and Joanne, yeah. and uh, I, it was hard to get through the rules, it was hard to get through like the fun part. There wasn't anything that stood out in terms of like, this is an exciting turn or something. Mm -hmm. So I think it was just a bad experience and it would probably be better if we played again. But yeah, probably. I'm just like, haven't been desiring to go again and play it. Yeah, it doesn't help that we have so many good games right now that we really need to get through. So. Yeah, I think that's part of it too. If we just ran out of games, then we'd get back to it. But there's just always a never ending amount of hype to go through. So yeah, just pushing through. And my answer is the same. Uh, I say same, uh, PAX Premier, second mm -hmm. edition, where, I mean, I completely get why some people really love the game, um, mm -hmm. because it seems like a brilliant game. And it's amazing that there's so much depth packed into a game that has very little um, space, like footprint-wise yeah, uh, and component-wise. And so I can see the brilliance of it, but it just doesn't hit the right spot for me. And typically with games, I mean, I mean it's an 
I think it's mostly has to do with how complex it is. But with games, usually when I make a move, even if it's not immediately during, immediately after that move, but after a turn has passed or something, I have an idea of like, okay, that was a bad move or that was a good move. There's a little bit of a feedback that I can get from the game that, oh, I did something good or I did something clever or really bad. Mm -hmm. But for PAX Premier, I, I just had no idea where the game was heading to. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that, the way you describe that is kind of how I felt about Black Angel. I never felt like I got an understanding of what good moves were. Joanne just happened to always make great moves uh, when we played and just that game fell flat in the same way. So I think Black Angel would be the other one that mm. I thought would be a great hit, but just didn't really work well. Yeah. I mean, I guess we should give it a, you know, second play in the future. Sure. Yeah. And see how it turns out. Uh, number three, let's see. Um, from user Marsh Wiggle 92 What has been your best surprise? Best surprise game of the year? Uh, you know, I think... I don't know if there's any surprises because I buy games because they are highly reviewed and highly rated. Yeah. I think the amount of which I liked Quacks is surprising, so I think that would probably be the biggest surprise. Okay. Um, so I besides that, everything else was kind of like expected to be good. So that's I think Quacks is the closest to that. Okay. For me, it was Skull Hollow, and the reason is because, you know, it's not a game that we bought, but it was a review copy sent to us, so I think those tend to be the surprises, because we never really know what to expect. Yeah, and it tend to be on the lower end. Yes, yes, yes. But with Skull Hollow, it turned out to be, you know, a game that was, you know, uh, really good. Yeah. Yeah. And, I mean, I already talked about it uh, earlier, so I don't think I have to talk about it more. So. Yeah. Very good game. Uh, number four. Uh, oops. Ah, wait. Number four from user Rans Rancid Rancid Mike. Okay, Rancid Mike. What do you know now that you wish you had known when you started getting into the hobby? Good question. What do I? All right, you answer first. Let's <laughs> I can't think of anything. Let's see. Hmm. What do I wish I had known that I know now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think my answer would be that um, to not get ahead of myself in following hype with games when I make a purchase. I think that's the simplest one for me. Yeah, yeah. that's like... Half of the fun of the hobby for me is just getting into the hype and making the purchase. I mean, I tend especially to be, when I find yeah, a good deal. <laughs> yeah, I I tend to be more careful about my purchases in general, whatever it is. And but there are times when I, you know, uh, especially in the beginning of the hobby, when I made you know one or two purchases and I played it maybe once, and it wasn't a hit with Anna, and it was uh, Railroad Inc. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We played it once. I could immediately see that she was just like, oh, okay, you know, it was a good, you know, it's an okay game. Yeah. And then immediately after that, like a couple of days after that, we played Welcome To With You. Yeah. And then she was like, oh, you know, <laughs> this is such a good game. And then I immediately regret it. So, yeah. I think uh, the only thing I wish I had done is started logging my plays immediately because <laughs> looking at the last... Like, that one visual I added to the website is now the first reason that I'm happy I've been logging plays because I never really felt like it was worth it until that moment where I yeah. got to see this visual. It's kind of fun. Yeah. So I kind of wish I did that more. And I missed a few. I rem like, I didn't see Skull Call listed. Mm -hmm. It should have been because I played it a few times. Uh, so I just wish I would be consistent. Yeah. And I, I know you're going to be putting more value into that feature, you know, starting next year. So I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, maybe even before next year. I'm going to be working on Board Game Geek integration improvements and then play logs based on the supporter-only forum post that we had. Okay. Well, you know, you know that I never mind you doing more stuff. So yeah. <laughs> since I'm not the one doing it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. 
So last question, again from user Rancid Mike. And I think it's a good question to close off for this night. And not just for this night, but for this year, because this is our last podcast episode for the year. And it is, what do you hope for the future of BGA? Big question. So I hope for BGA, and based on the growth and the everything, I'm almost expecting at this point that Board Game Atlas will be the place for people to come and talk about board games and enjoy the hobby more than if they were just to try and enjoy it through their own means. And I think that through uh, making the forum better, making the features better, and working on all these things, having a native mobile app, I think are just gonna aid in getting to that pursuit of being the ultimate place to talk about Mm -hmm. and enjoy board games. So that's kind of the ultimate goal for it. I think with the end of 2019, the combined user base that we have now is 79,000 users, which is exciting. And so having that is motivating me to continue working on new features and new things for the website specifically, but the whole brand in general. I think just bringing more fun to board games Mm -hmm. is the ultimate goal, and I think the website is the best way to to continue doing that with cool features. Mm -hmm. Well put. Mm -hmm. Um, What do I hope? Well, I mean, I tend to take... I, I usually need a lot of time to process these si- these types of questions. So I probably can't come up with a good answer for it right now. But uh, something that I can think of at the moment is um, like less macro but more micro, where mm-hmm. I do a lot of content creation. And mm-hmm. one of the things that I do is interviews. And one of the, the big reason why I do interviews is because I really, really love the aspect of discovering about the different people in the industry, their stories and their backgrounds, Mm -hmm. uh, their origins, and then being able to share it with others and being able to promote them. Ultimately, that's like the biggest thing, that I get to promote all these really fantastic people who design games, uh, illustrate, um, publish, edit rule books. You know, just all these people that aren't very highlighted all the time. Mm Games get a lot of hype and games get a lot of attention, but the people behind it don't as much. So one of my hopes for the upcoming, you know, for the upcoming year and and so on is that BGA will become a place where people know that they can come to us to discover about all these different people. Yeah. So that's one of my big hopes. Hopes that you know, especially as a content creator, it's such a struggle where to self promote. It's such an awkward thing to do, also, and hard. And so I hope that PGA can be a place that is very friendly to content creators, and then and a place where they can come and just interact with interact with different community users and feel very supported. Yeah. Yeah. So that's like me. It. Yeah. Very cool. Well, thank you for leading us to this podcast, Phil. Yeah. No problem. I enjoyed it. Those were some good user questions, too. Yeah, it was. So, I mean, that was our last episode for the year. Thank you for just your support, just your continued support, really, um, especially through our you know support drive that's happening right now. Uh, we're halfway there, so that's exciting. And, you know, and especially for our users on, on the forum, how you guys have been so supportive of us and just, you know, always, you know, sending good vibes, even when Trent was doing his marathon, how you guys you know kept on visiting to leave comments and cheer him up, and how you guys continue to contribute so much to the forum to make it feel very lively, and it has been feeling very lively, so I love it. So we're looking more, we're really looking forward to next year, and you know we'll be back with more content than that you know you'd like. Yeah, yeah, cool. See you later. Thank you.